so. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I'm Sophie Mills, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I wanted to start with a verse, a couple of verses that we, me and all the people that I was with, kept it kept coming on our hearts while we were there. So I thought it was a perfect place to start. Um, Psalm 113.3, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. Um, let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God, I just thank you um, for this time that we can be together in your house, God, in your presence. Um, as a body of believers, Lord, we pray that this time would be a time of encouragement, God, of edification, Lord, that we would walk away having a higher view of you, Lord. Um, speak through me, God, and we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so I have a couple of pictures. We'll get, well... We'll get to that. So for those of you who don't know, um, last February, February 8th, um, I was in Mexico for two months. And um, I went with a couple from my church in Minnesota. They are, were long-term missionaries there back in the 80s and the 90s. Um, they're in their 80s probably and uh, have gone back every few years since, since moving back to the States. Um, just to keep building relationships, check on the ministries that they helped start. Uh, so on and so forth. So this last fall, uh, they had another opportunity to go. Um, so real quick, so this is a map of Mexico. Obviously the red spot is the state of Oaxaca, so that's where we were all of the time. And then the next map, <laughs> kids songs also. So this is the state of Oaxaca, just a picture of it cut out. Um, up on your upper left, the words are really blurry, but that says Wawapin. So we were there first, and then we headed straight south, it's not on there, but to a place called Tlaquiaco, and that was in the mountains. And then we went down to um, a place called Mancuernas, but that was by Pinotepa Nacional, um, down the bottom left. So just to give you guys an idea of where we were, um, since we were there for so long, we got to go to all three places and um, have a few weeks in each spot. Um, so yeah, so back to the story. Uh, in the fall, we were originally supposed to go for three months. Um, the, the husband of the couple I went with, he had driven down all the way, a very long journey, um, so that we could have a car to go to all the places. And my role, kind of, was to travel with the wife um, to Mexico. She is in poor health. The husband is, is really good health. She's in poor health, and it would be difficult for her to fly alone. And um, so I was her companion, essentially. So I had flown to Minnesota to fly down with her, um, and the Lord changed our plans drastically. Um, she's diabetic. She ended up getting really sick. So her husband's already in, in Mexico. We're in Minnesota trying to figure out how to get there. Our flights end up getting changed multiple times. Um, we end up, it's a four-day process of us, either our planes getting delayed, our planes getting canceled, and then she got really sick. She ends up being in the hospital for three days, I think, so I'm, I'm there with her in the hospital. Her husband's in Mexico thinking, what do we do? Um, so he ends up coming home, long story short, and, uh, you know, I, I came back here and kind of assumed this isn't, this isn't supposed to happen, even though it seems so clear, you know, this isn't going to happen. Um, praise God, he opened the door again for us to go in February, so... Obviously, we didn't end up going, moral of the story. Um, so our time there, so we were down in Wawapin first, like I said, that's okay, it's not up there, but um, we were in an orphanage to start with. Um, this orphanage is connected to the church and the place where we were, and um, there's a young family, actually the, the wife um, is American and the husband is Mexican, they're about my age. And uh, so that was really fun because their kids all spoke English and Spanish, you know, it had a little taste of home. Um, but they were in an orphanage there with about 15 girls. Uh, and then when the boys, they have boys there too, but when the boys get to a certain age, they go on to that next place to Lakiaco um, to live and to work on a farm. Uh, so our time there was really sweet. The guy, uh, the, the husband that I was with, he, he preached a lot of the time uh, that we were there. And it was a good initial transition because 
I wasn't having to be full on Spanish, it was still some English too. <laughs> um, I was finding really quickly how difficult it was to not be able to communicate clearly with people. I, if you know me, I love to be able to communicate and I hate when that's taken away. So um, God humbled me a lot of times to be like, no, you just have to observe and listen and you know, do your best to, to figure out what you can. Um, but even in that time, of not having of having a language barrier, it was crazy to see just how um, how special the body of Christ is. You know, to be able to connect with other believers, even with a language barrier, you still feel that connection of, of we are closer than family in some ways. Um, so that was great. My role was really to support the the wife and the family that we were staying with. And these, this is the orphanage we'll walk in, so you see there's a few kids. We would do lots of thumbs up if it was like, okay, we're talking and we kind of understand each other, but not totally. <laughs> thumbs up is universal, so lots of thumbs up. Um, some great smiling faces. You know, obviously hard to hear their stories um, of the places they came from. Um, so this one is a chapel or a church, I guess. This is what a lot of the churches look down, like down on the coast. Um, this was a fairly small one in a village called Candela, um, and so we would go there in the evenings, and the guy I was with, he would preach a lot of the time. Um, this church, though, they said even 10 years ago, this village was completely drug-ridden, super dangerous, so the fact that they have a church that is still thriving and functioning um, is amazing, yeah. So if you see in this picture on the right side, there's a guy in a blue shirt and then the older guy next to him. Um, his name is Abel, and he was really one of the first, he brought the gospel to this part of the coast for the first time. So the guy I went with, he had shared the gospel to him, and he lives down there, and then he's continued to spread the word of God. So that's been like 40 years. And so again, to see the work that he's continuing to do, um, even when the people I was traveling with aren't there, is amazing. This was just a soccer game <laughs> um, in Mexico. So we, this was on the farm in Tlaxdaco, the mountain village, uh, where we were able to go and serve them too. So again, it was, a, it was an orphanage, but it's the older boys. And how they do it is they can stay as long as, um, as, long as they'd like. They can stay and work and help contribute to the farm and have a safe place. A lot of these kids' parents were in drugs and um, they were abandoned a lot of the time. So it's awesome for them to have a place to come stay. Um, and then this was also in Tlaxiaco, the mountain village. Um, again, just another man of faithfulness. His name is Filiberto, and uh, he's one of the guy, Tim, that I came with, his, his good friends. He goes to the market every day still. He just turned 90. He goes to the market every day, this huge market, um, unloads all his stuff. He has Bibles and different materials. And, I mean, just while we were sitting there with them, he went up to this guy and was sharing the gospel and praying with them. And, again, for him to be so faithful at his age, he's still traveling out to a lot of the smaller villages. Um, so, in this area, there's a ton of Catholicism. I mean, generally in Mexico, you know, that's what you'll see. Um, but then even in these villages, you'll see a lot of Mesteco Indians or different um, tribes. And so they have a lot of their own gods, too. And so even in this part where we're at, he, uh, it's, it's fairly dangerous for him to be, you know, a believer sharing like that in the marketplace, you know. Um, I mean, they have a church there. It's allowable. But um, there's a lot of people that don't like it. So we, uh, just a quick story. We had... Um, a, a couple from Texas that were in this um, area that Tim and Dia, the people I went with, knew really well. And they've been missionaries there a long time too. And they would go out to the villages. This one is super um, obscure, and so they'd go for like two weeks at a time because you can't really travel back and forth through the mountains, you know, very quickly. Um, and they ended up getting essentially kidnapped one time um, about 20 years ago, yeah, by people who were dressed as policemen. Um, but you know, in a small village like that, there's not a lot of checks and balances per se. And uh, they ended up yeah, getting kidnapped by the providence of God. He, um, another missionary had ended up passing through that village and had seen that something was going on and was able to help get them out. Um, but it came out later that it was another, um, one of the Catholic priests there that had um, ordained that or you know, put together that whole plot basically to take them away because they're that threatened. So not to say all Catholic folks are bad, but just for that to be the perspective, you know what I mean, of <laughs> um, 
that they would go to those links, you know, to essentially silence them. So, um, yeah, it was very, very interesting. Another story, um, we went to a little village, and Tim speaks about how he remembers this guy 32 years ago, you know, a teenager, so rebellious, so disruptive, just sitting in the front seat of this little meeting they're trying to have. There wasn't a church in this town yet. And he says that he they preached the gospel, and this kid ended up coming after up afterwards and um, repenting of his sin. And uh, so we visited that village, and there's now a church that he pastors that he's had going strong for like 32 years. So, um, yeah, it was a really interesting experience to, I've been on other mission trips where it's very organized, it's very scheduled, usually with a big group, you know, it's pretty specific. Um, with this, since they lived there and it was just us three essentially traveling around, it was a lot more of real life, I felt like. And, you know, being there for two months, it's a little different time frame. You have time to settle in um, a little bit more. And, yeah, it was it was wild to just kind of have to, we had a plan generally, but to just kind of sit back and see what the Lord would do, um, be able to, to connect in, in different ways. Um, the people on the coast, so not this place, but... Uh, that other church I showed you, they church meetings down there are no less than three hours for sure. It will not be less than three hours. It's hot, you're sweating, everyone's yeah. It's and we had meetings six out of seven nights probably. I mean you're not you had your specific Wednesday and Sunday, but different villages there's always something. Um, but just kind of their dedication to the word of God and worshiping together was so admirable. Um, there was a distinct difference between those that were believers and those that weren't in all areas of life. If I saw someone on the street, I feel like you could easily, not that it was always legalistic in what they're wearing or not, but even in the interaction, we interacted with a lot of non-believers, but it was very clear, you know, that they were truly transformed. And I just, I appreciated that so much. Um, and just the, the times of testimony, a lot of these three hour meetings, if it was more like a Bible study and not a full service, um, it was a lot of just sharing testimony of how God was <laughs> healing and moving and things that were happening day by day. You know, it wasn't like this once in a lifetime thing. Um, so for them to to have the faith that those things could happen and also then be so diligent to thank God for them and remember them um, was really neat. Uh, a huge praise, the lady Dia that got really sick before we could go. She did so well health wise. I mean, she just was like thriving, walking distances she hadn't walked in 10 years. I mean, she, uh, with her diabetes, she has some blood, uh, blood vessels that were bursting in her eye. And so her doctor had said, you may have to travel back to Oaxaca while you're down there and, you know, go see someone for an injection. And her eye started getting irritated one day and, and we prayed over her, a group of us, and the next day her eye, like there was no redness, like, you know, just, just that God was so faithful. Um, you see how... The timing of his ways was was the perfect timing for us to go um, and come back. But yeah, I just I just wanted to read one more um, passage. Actually, two more. They're short. Don't worry. Um, so first of all, so like I said, Tim, who I went with, he preached a lot of the time. Um, and one thing, one thing, one challenge that he would always give that I'm going to give to you guys is he said that everyone should read Psalm 119 every single week. So, <laughs> good luck. It's super long. But if you need a challenge this week, go read Psalm 119. Um, one of the areas that like, he would preach out of a lot, he would preach out of the Psalms a lot, and he um, talked on Psalm 27, verses 1 through 4 a lot, which says, um, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord, that I will, will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Um, again, just to see such a stark difference in, in life, and to see the Bible so applicable to all aspects of every life that we encountered, as well as our own, um, was a huge blessing for me. Um, and then one more, one more set of verses. Um, this is in Acts 17, if you want to follow along. Acts 17, 23. I'll start there. 
For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance of God, God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given the assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Um, so again, this verse just kept these verses uh, just being laid on my heart so heavy with, with these people trying so hard <laughs> to worship something that they have no, no idea, the unknown God, right? The inscription, the, the statues, the idols, driving through Mexico, so many idols. Um, idols here in the States that aren't so obvious. There, they were very obvious. Um, but I just, you know, again, that gratefulness that we do have a God that is known and can be known. And, uh, and he shares exactly who he is. So, yeah, I just want to say thank you guys so much. Your prayers in every way that you supported me. Uh, I felt the entire time. And I'm so appreciative. It was a wonderful trip. So much good food. My mom's cooking's not quite as good now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was a, it was good. She's still a really good cook, I promise. But, um, yeah, it was a wonderful time. And, just, yeah, thank you guys.